compañeros. A continuación vamos a proceder con la presentación de nuestra conferencia invitada. Eh, esta conferencia va a ser impartida en inglés, así que voy a, pre a presentar a, a nuestro invitado también en esta lengua. Voy a ser muy breve porque ya vamos un poquito justo de tiempo y acabamos de empezar la, la mañana. So, uh, Professor Todjiwell, he is a professor of economics and chair of the department of, uh, of uh, finance and economics at uh, Texas State uh, University. Uh, his research is focused on the economics of uh, soccer as well as other college sports such as uh, basketball or football. Uh, Professor Todd has already made an important contribution to the uh, economic literature with more than 30 uh, high impact publications in journals like Journal of Sport Economics, Economic Enquiry, or Contemporary Economic uh, Society. So today, Professor Jewell is presenting the work entitled The Economic of uh, Soccer, uh, Association Football, North American Style. I hope you all, you all enjoy this presentation as much as I will do. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Jewell, for being here today, and it is all yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I have been here in uh, Ciudad Real and in Spain for about three weeks now. Uh, I've had the opportunity to go to Barcelona, very nice. I went to Madrid, very nice. I went to Sevilla, which, uh, are there some folks from Sevilla here? Yes, v very, very beautiful city, Sevilla. Muy bonita. Uh, I would first of all like to thank uh, uh, the university uh, for sponsoring my stay here. I'd like to uh, especially thank my hosts, Julio de Colal and Carlos Gomez Gonzalez, who have been uh, who have been very, 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 uh, very good hosts. And I have the opportunity to do a couple of papers with them. Um, as uh, Carlos mentioned, uh, my name is Todd Jewell. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Finance and Economics at Texas State University. That's in a city called San Marcos, Texas, which is just a little bit south of Austin. And just to make certain, you know, that this is clear, I'm not at the University of Texas, so I'm not a Longhorn, as they say. Uh, we are the Bobcats, which. I don't know if that's more exciting and dangerous than a Longhorn, but uh, we're pretty proud to be Bobcats. The university is very large. My university has about 40,000 students. Okay? We have a lot of students. We have a lot of econ students. We have, uh, 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 we have uh, graduate students, etc. cetera. And um, in the United States, professional sports and college sports are two things that, that are studied fairly intensively. But association football, foot, what you call football, what we call soccer in the United States, is not studied that intensively. One of the reasons it's not studied that intensively is because it's, it's, re, it's really a relatively new phenomenon in the United States. I know that it is the major sport in the rest of the world. In the United States, it doesn't even compare to the popularity of what we call football, which I'll refer to as gridiron football, baseball, basketball, and even auto racing, if you're familiar with NASCAR. So football or soccer? Okay, well, um, here you would call it football. In, in some parts of the American continent, that is mainly Mexico and South, they would also call it football, obviously because those are Spanish-speaking countries. But when you get to the United States and Canada, if they refer to football, they're referring to gridiron football. Uh, gridiron football in Canada is slightly different. There's some, sli you know, there's some slightly different rules, but, but it's very similar. Uh, the Canadian Football League is very similar to uh, the National Football League. And again, uh, football in the United States, what I will call gridiron, is the most popular sport. It's the most popular sport in the United States by far. In fact, it's probably, you know, if you're going to rank it, it's probably the NFL is number one and then college football is number two. Okay? And then baseball and basketball, etc., 
you know, kind of follow. But football in the United States, that is gridiron football, is the most popular sport, okay? Um, and in fact, uh, uh, the last pull, uh, bullet point I have there is it, it, when, when fans are polled in the United States, uh, the U.S. generally places soccer behind, behind gridiron football, and that's, that's the NFL and collegiate football, baseball, basketball, ice hockey, and auto racing. I mean, so in the United States, it probably is the fifth or sixth most, most popular sport. Okay? The top professional league in the United States and Canada is Major League Soccer. You're familiar with this, I'm sure. Major League Soccer is incredibly unique in the way that it does business. The business model of Major League Soccer is very, very different. Okay? And, part, and, and the major reason behind these differences is because of the, frankly, because of the lack of popularity of the sport in the United States. Okay? Uh, there, it, it has some advantages, but there are major disadvantages in that it, uh, um, Major League Soccer is trying to build a professional league in an environment in the United States that is very highly saturated with professional sports. Okay? MLS plays a summer schedule, so that MLS is playing from April to October, which is very different than what is done in Europe. The league also uh, has a North American style playoff system, so that what you have is you have a league champion, and the league champion gets what is referred to as the supporters shield, but that really doesn't mean much in, in, in uh, Major League Soccer. That really doesn't mean much. The regular season championship, quote unquote, doesn't mean much in North American sports. It's the playoffs that matter, okay? And it's the team that wins the playoffs that is considered the champion. Another thing that is extremely important and that we need to keep in mind is that Major League Soccer has only existed since 1996. It is an extremely young league. So some of the unique features. Well, it is a very, very young league, but that's kind of exciting for us to look at Major League Soccer and see what's happening and see how it is growing. Major League Soccer is a great point of comparison. It's a great point of comparison to other soccer leagues, association football leagues around the world, as well as other leagues in the United States, okay? It is a place in which, um, frankly, the owners are experimenting. They're trying to figure out how to compete in the North American marketplace. Okay? It's, it, it again, is, it, is, it is extremely different with a brand new league, a sport that is very popular around the world, but not that popular in the United States yet. As a sidelight, okay, um, Many of you understand that uh, the U.S. men's soccer team is not that great, okay? U.S. is a huge country that produces a lot of very high-quality athletes, but very few of them go into professional soccer if you're talking about the men's side. Now, you compare that to the women's side, okay? The women's soccer team is one of the best in the world. Why is that? Well, some of you would know this, okay? But the reason is, there, you know, there's actually two reasons. One is culturally in the United States, soccer, association football, is seen as a women's sport. It's not seen as the primary sport that males, uh, <coughs> pardon me, that males play as they're growing up. Okay, that's number one. Number two because of some federal regulations, which I, won't get, uh, which I won't go into right now, but if you're curious about them, I can talk to you, to, I can talk to you about them later. Uh, some federal regulations, one of them is called Title IX, um, U.S. federal regulations, means that any money that, that colleges put into male sports, they also have to put this, a similar amount into female sports. Okay? So that what you have is you have a, a very uh, significant amount of funding that goes into females, female collegiate sports. Well, soccer is one of those games that women will play in the United States and they have an opportunity to go to college and be funded to get their education and that's where a lot of the development happens. So what you see for women's 
on the women's side is that these players are developed in college, they go into the women's national team and they're some of the best in the world. The, the men's team doesn't work that way because the best male athletes in the United States go into, go into gridiron, baseball, basketball, etc. cetera. Okay? Uh, MLS has also a very unique single entity ownership structure. This was set up originally to try to make certain that all teams had some sort of opportunity to exist and persist over time. MLS was trying not to make some of the mistakes of the old North American Soccer League, which really priced itself out of existence. And so what they were really trying to do is say, look, we understand, Major League Soccer understands, that we're looking at um, a, we're looking at an environment in which soccer is not that important. It's, it's growing, it's growing, but it's a very competitive professional sports landscape in the United States. What we're going to do is start small. The Major League Soccer started small and said, okay, let's just, let's get things started. Let's make certain that we're sharing as many revenues as we can and make certain that no individual team, <coughs> pardon me, is able to dominate the league. That would, they, they were concerned about this from the very beginning. They did not want individual teams being able to stockpile talent. For those of you that, that, are, that have any sort of experience um, with professional soccer in the United States, okay, there was something called the North American Soccer League. Okay? And in fact, Pele played in the North American Soccer League. Okay? Well, there were a couple of teams in the North American Soccer League that had a bunch of very good players. Uh, and, but what happened was is you had one or two teams that had, that had all the players, and they won everything, and it got boring for the American soccer fan. Culturally, I believe, and I think that there's evidence to suggest, that fans in the United States are more concerned about competitive balance than maybe in other places. I mean, I don't know exactly why that is, but one of the reasons the NFL is so successful is because of the incredible competitive balance that it has, for instance. Okay, so MLS also has a league-wide salary cap, and again, that's to try to you know, make certain that no individual team can stockpile all the talent. There, are some, there have been some adjustments to the salary cap over time, which I'll talk about momentarily. MLS is a closed league system with no relegation or promotion. Again, we'll talk about that. That's different than what happens in European leagues, and I think most of you are familiar with this. The one thing that I want to highlight here, and I will highlight several different times through the presentation, we cannot forget how dependent Major League Soccer is on game day revenues. What I mean by that is m most professional sports in the United States <clears throat> make most of their money from broadcast revenue, TV contracts. That's where the, that's where the gold mine is in, in the United States. And I think, that, I think that that's similar around the world. But in the United States, it, it's, it's extremely important for a league to have a TV contract. And, and what I mean by that is a national TV contract. Okay, well, okay, um, Major League Soccer does not have a significant national TV contract. It has a national TV contract, but it's also something that it isn't clear how much of that money, <coughs> pardon me, actually goes to Major League Soccer because it's a contract that is shared with the U.S. Soccer Federation for, for men's national team games. And so it's, it, it isn't completely clear how much of this money actually goes to Major League Soccer. So just a quick comparison between a league that you all understand and Major League Soccer. And just you know, to, give you, you know, to give you a couple of points of comparison. Okay, initial year for MLS was 1996. It's a young league. It's only been around for 21 years. Okay? La Liga started in 1929, or that's what I'm told, but you probably have had professional or semi-professional leagues in, in Spain for a, for a very, very, very long time. This is, obviously, this is part of your culture. La Liga is 
part of your culture. Real Madrid, Barcelona, Sevilla, you know, Real Batiste. Whatever, whatever team you follow, it's an extremely important part of your culture. Now, in the United States, the equivalent is what National Football League team do you, do you follow? It's not do you, uh, do you follow FC Dallas or do you follow the Houston Dynamo or something. I mean, you know, pe most people, if I would talk to them about that, wouldn't even, you know, wouldn't know what, you know, what the heck those two teams were. Okay, the ownership in, in, in MLS is single entity. Now, just, you know, to, to, to uh, clear that up, what that means is that the, that the league owns approximately 50% of every team. But owners buy into the team <clears throat> and also buy into the league, okay? It is basically a concept that says we're going to make a single company, Major League Soccer, that effectively owns all the teams. And decisions are made at the league level. Contracts for players are signed at the league level. There are, again, there are, there, there, there are you know, some exceptions to that rule, and it becomes fairly complicated when you try to you know, distinguish between okay, what, what percent of David Beckham's salary was being paid by the, the league and what part was being paid by the team, et cetera. But, um, basically, basically, all teams are effectively owned by the league. Um, owners are referred to as owner operators in Major League Soccer, which is to say they don't completely own the team. They, may, they, they own it, they operate it, they have access to about half the revenues, but not all the revenues. It's a salary cap for Major League Soccer. It's league-wide for every team. There are some exceptions to that, but each team has a specific amount of salary. The total salary has to be under that, and it's not very much. When I tell you what it is, you're going to think, uh, how in the world can they do this? Well, they don't pay players that much. Okay? Uh, salary cap in La Liga is like many European leagues. It's, it varies by team and it has to do with how, how much revenue you come in and you know, depend, you know, it depends on the league but you know, it's kind of based on you know, this idea of financial fair play, et cetera, et cetera. But you, know, you look at La Liga and um, the, the quote unquote salary cap for you know, Real Madrid is going to be very different than the quote unquote salary cap for a team that does not generate as much revenue. That does not happen in Major League Soccer. Everybody has the same salary cap. Closed league system versus an open league system. And then this last point again, which I want to hit again, and I will hit several different times, because this is the important uh, part of Major League Soccer, and one I, one I think is, is, the, is really the, the, you know, the crux of why we care as economists or as sports management professionals why we care about what's happening in Major League Soccer. We care about what's happening in Major League Soccer because they have to, they are only going to um, make it, they're only going to sustain the league at this point by increasing gate revenues. Gate revenues, what happens getting fans bottoms in the seats is the most important thing for them right now. Okay? For La Liga, um, yes, attendance money is important, and for some teams it's more important than others, okay? But there's a lot of money, even for lower-ranked teams, that come in from broadcasting revenue. Major League Soccer's broadcasting rev revenue is minimal. Most of what they're bringing in is from game day revenue. Forbes magazine had a report a few years ago that said 90%, 90% of revenue that came into Major League Soccer teams came in from game day sources. Now that's attendance, uh, concessions, parking, you know, these sorts of monies that come when you get fans in the gate. A very small portion comes from broadcasting and sponsorship. Okay, something I pulled off of the internet which I thought, you know, <laughs> clarifies what we're talking about here in terms of the differences. The NFL, and these numbers are from 2015, the NFL generated $13 billion in revenue, 
13 billion dollars in revenue in 2015. The truth is most NFL teams don't need fans because they make so much money from TV revenue even if no fans came to the game they'd still make money. If you own an NFL franchise it's a license to print money. They're making a, they're making just a huge chunk of change. Premier League is up there. Uh, La Liga is listed at at about 2.2 billion, and you know you guys could tell me whether or not you know that's an accurate amount. These are all estimates. Okay, but let me show you. You can't really see this because it's not big enough. But let me show you where Major League Soccer is. That's Major League Soccer down there. Major League Soccer generates between 450 and 500 mil million dollars every year. Okay, not. A significant amount of money and as I said about 90% of that comes from comes from game day revenues now just to give you an idea this is the second Bundesliga so the second Bundesliga generates more money than Major League Soccer Major League Soccer is here and this is the Japanese J League so so that's the comparison you cannot compare the NFL Major League Soccer, the Premier League, La Liga. You can't compare that to MLS. It's a different animal at this point. But again, the major difference is in fact broadcast revenue. So I'll stop for a moment and remind you of, <laughs> of the major point that I will continue to make. And that is Major League Soccer is continually dependent upon game day attendance and making certain that they maximize attendance and maximize game day revenue. But they've also got to consider if they're going to, long term, the only way that they're going to survive in a very extremely highly competitive North American <laughs> sports marketplace, the only way that they're going to survive is if they get, if they get a significant TV contract. Okay? By the way, uh, for those of you uh, that know what NASCAR is, okay. That's, that's the main race, uh, car racing circuit in the United States. Estimates have NASCAR at about $3 billion a year. Okay? So even compared to NASCAR, Major League Soccer isn't anywhere close. Couple of, cup, couple of comments about the single entity structure. Okay? Uh, t uh, and I, I've actually you know, already commented a couple of, uh, I've already made a couple of these comments. But basically, the single entity structure is put into place, and it, was cons it, it actually went through the court system in the United States, made it through the court system. It's legal in the United States, the way that Major League Soccer handles it. Um, and the main reason that they do this is they're trying to control player costs. They're trying to control player costs, but on top of that, what, by, by trying to control player costs and player distribution, they're trying to control competitive balance. Okay? The third bullet point there says MLS also has a salary cap. Now, the salary cap for this year is $3.845 million. Each team can only spend up to a little less than $4 million on total salaries. You can do the math. How much does Messi make? I don't know. Probably more than that. Okay. When David Beckham came into the league in 2007, which I'll talk about momentarily, he was making $5 million a year. <coughs> so there are exceptions to the salary cap, and that's why MLS salary cap is, salary cap is soft. And we'll talk about, uh, talk about what happened when... Uh, <coughs> pardon me, when David Beckham came into the league. Okay, so a characteristic of the MLS's business model that differ differentiates it from European leagues is a clo closed league system without promotion regulation. Now, that is a standard league system in the United States. It is my opinion, and the opinion of many observers, that eventually Major League Soccer will have promotion and relegation. But there's going to be two things that have to happen first. First of all, Major League Soccer is going to have to own the division below. That is, they're not going to 
They're not going to allow uh, a team to be relegated into a league that they don't have control over, nor are they going to let another team be <coughs> promoted <coughs> pardon me, from, a league, from a league that they don't control. Okay? Secondly, they've got to get to the point where there's a, that the league is strong enough that they've got enough investment in the league that they don't really need any more investment. At this point, they're trying to convince people to, to they're, they're trying to convince people to invest in a growing league and if you said to somebody you can come into this league and it's going to cost you a hundred million dollars to buy in oh but you might be relegated to the second division next year well the investor is not going to invest so as long as there is as long as the league is still growing and growing to the point where um, they, they want more, more Major League Soccer teams and more investment, there will be no, there will be no relegation. Okay? Uh, by the way, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, commissioner of Major League Soccer has suggested that the optimal uh, number of teams is about 30 for Major League Soccer, which probably seems large to you because most European leagues are like 20. But in the United States, most professional leagues are about 30. So I would suspect that once Major League Soccer gets to something like 30 teams and 30 teams that are financially viable, we might start to see. Okay? Importance of Major League Soccer attendance. In 1996, the average Major League Soccer, uh, uh, Major League Soccer uh, game had 17,000 people. Oh my goodness, that was the first year. They were expecting like 11. Woo, they were so excited. Okay, novelty effect. Boom, it crashed after that year. Okay? But then last year, Major League uh, uh, average attendance was 21,000, almost 22,000, which is pretty good. But again, they, had to, they have to do that or they're not going to make any money. Okay? Total revenue, as I showed you, even though attendance is higher, than the NBA and the NHL, total revenue is nowhere close. Okay? MLS knows, they absolutely know that they are dependent on game day revenues. They know that this is the case. But they also know that it, for, for this to survive in the long term, they've got to have a TV contract. They've got to get television revenues. So they, they've got two different things that they're trying to deal with right now. One is we've got to maximize game day attendance to, so, that we can, so that we can make money now. And then the long term, we've got to make a product that works on TV. MLS has, has done a few things since 1996. And three of the ones that I will concentrate on is, um, and I'm actually just going to concentrate on a couple of these. But um, Major League Soccer, just the rules, the way it's set up, the single entity structure, the salary cap, it's, it helps create a, a very competitively balanced league. MLS also understands that, that for them to be viable and taken seriously, they've got to have soccer-specific stadia. And Carlos and some of his co-authors have done a study which, which kind of looks into soccer specific stadia and it does look like in fact as one might expect that soccer specific stadia actually actually do uh, actually does help attendance okay one of the most important changes is the designated player rule in 2007 that's the beckham rule and i'll talk about that momentarily briefly to talk about competitive balance okay 11 teams won the mls championship in 21 years the two best teams won it four times each. Over the last 21 years, two teams in La Liga have won the championship 17 times. Okay? Now, do you care? That's a rhetorical question. Obviously, it doesn't matter that much. But competitive balance in the United States and for Major League Soccer might be very important. Okay? Specifically, what are some research questions about competitive balance? I think competitive balance is, is one of the most important questions that um, researchers who are interested in dealing with Major League Soccer 
I think competitive balance is one of the most important issues because competitive balance is going to directly impact game day attendance. It also is going to directly impact whether or not Major League Soccer can get that TV contract. Remember, short term, they've got to generate, they've got to get fans in the seats. Long term, to be sustainable, they've got to get a, a bigger TV contract, otherwise they can't compete in, a TV, in, 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 in a, the North American market. Okay, so interesting, I, you know, I, I'm running out of time a little bit, so I kind of ran through a, a comparison on the previous slide, but basically Major League Soccer is a, is a much more competitive league than, than major European leagues. It is. Is the degree, I think, it, uh, I, I, think it's imp I think it's important to analyze why is that. And that's important not just for Major League Soccer, but it's important <laughs> for European leagues. That is, Major League Soccer is an important point of comparison. Maybe Europeans don't care about this. Maybe they do. What is Major League Soccer doing that works that could translate to other leagues? Okay. And then the fourth po bullet point there is, well, but how much does competitive balance really matter? And I don't think that question, at least in Major League Soccer, has been answered. We don't know. It's too young of a league. But this is something going forward to try to figure out how much competitive balance matters. This will be an important thing for us to look at and I think it's an important point of comparison between established, mature European leagues and this very immature, young, growing league in the United States. Quickly talk about uh, the designated player rule. Designated player rule, there's a good side, there's a bad side, right? I mean, designated player, designated player rule allows major league soccer teams to, to to get to bu to buy players and to pay them more than what the salary cap is. There's a limit on the number that they can have. There's you know et cetera et cetera et cetera. Okay, but and this does raise the this raises the profile of the league. you you know David Beckham. You probably are aware of the fact that David Beckham played in MLS. If David Beckham had not played in MLS, you might not know this that the Major League Soccer even existed. You know that there's a Spanish player that's playing in Major League Soccer right now, and his name is? Of course you do. Of course. People, people know, you know that David Villa now plays in Major League Soccer. Maybe you care a little bit more about it now. Maybe you don't. Okay? But for the American sports fan, that's an important thing to raise the profile. That's an important thing. We're try Major League Soccer is trying to raise the profile. But it could possibly have an effect on competitive balance. Okay? One of the, uh, uh, I, I, I uh, did a paper uh, that, that uh, recently came out in uh, Journal of Sports Economics that looked at the first generation, David Beckham and, you know, the next four, four or five years of, of uh, designated players. Turns out that, yeah, they helped attendance a little bit, but it was really kind of a novelty effect. So going forward, Major League Soccer has to decide what they're going to do, what they're going to do with um, the designated player rule. It changes a little bit every year. They tweak it, but again, the idea is to try to get high-profile players in. You get high-profile players in, that raises the profile of the league. They're trying not to screw up competitive balance too much because that's that's important. But in order for them to get a TV contract, they need, they need higher profile players. OK, so I've got a couple of minutes uh, to conclude. And then if there are any questions, I will take those questions. The points that, I'm, that I've tried to make to you, this, is not, you know, this has not been a research presentation. This is not about you know, a research paper. Okay? This is about. What are the institutional issues going on in Major League Soccer that are important for people that study Major League Soccer, but are also important for, for people that generally study sports leagues around the world and are interested in things like competitive balance? Okay? Major League Soccer is an interesting test case. You compare La Liga, what's happening you know, in La Liga to Major League Soccer, there's some very interesting comparisons there. 
If you happen to be st somebody who studies other North American sports, basketball, baseball, football, there are some interesting comparisons there, okay? Why is it, or how can Major League Soccer grow? How can Major League Soccer get to the point where it's generating revenues at a significant you know, level? Are they ever gonna, are they ever gonna you know, get to the $1 billion mark? Well, I'd like to see them get there, but that's, that might take some time. Okay. MLS has unique characteristics, but those unique characteristics do provide an interesting laboratory to compare. The issues that I briefly discussed <coughs> include competitive balance, soccer-specific stadia, and the designated player rule. But there are many other institutional differences that provide fertile ground for economic policy and management analysis. And again, one, one of the things that I'll remind you of is that there are cultural differences between fans in the United States and fans elsewhere. Major League Soccer is an interesting area to research. I've been lucky enough to, you know, to, to uh, dip my toe in it at the very beginning. And so, if there are any questions, I thank you for your attention. Cinco minutos para alguna pregunta que alguien quiera hacerle. Una pregunta en, en inglés o español, está bien. O catalán, no. I, I do have a question, actually. So you said that one of the main difference is probably the cultural difference, right? But is there any kind of a strategy that the MLS is currently implemented to, to promote soccer among kids, for example? Kids leagues or young player leagues. Is there any strategy there? Um, that's an interesting question. The question was, is there, is there any strategy that Major League Soccer is using to try to encourage kids to get involved in soccer? Um, another sort of cultural phenomenon in the United States is boys and girls play soccer when they're kids. That's not difficult. Mm -hmm. The point is, when they get to be about nine or ten years old, they start playing basketball and baseball and gridiron football. So what Major League Soccer has done is very, you know, is very similar to some of the, some of the things that are done in European countries where they, they're, they're, try, they're trying to get local clubs mm -hmm. and trying to develop kids and get them into some academies. Mm -hmm. So that Major League Soccer is starting some academies, but the academy assist the, the soccer academy system in the United States is, you know, it, it's, it, it's at a very, 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 very young stage. And you also have to understand that, that the, the typical way that, that athletes develop in the United States is not by going to an academy. That's a, that's a very different way to do this. Most kids will go, um, they'll play soccer, or football, or baseball, and then they'll go to high school, and, high, and, and sports in high school are very big, so that they'll develop in high school, and then they'll go to college. Most athletes in the United States have gone through the, uh, the school system to get trained. So an academy system like what you're talking about mm -hmm. is something that is developing, but it's gonna take a while, because again, culturally, that's not the way that that athletes have been developed in the United States. It's a, it's Thank different. you. Alguna pregunta? Estamos de acuerdo. No. Bien, pues entonces tenemos una pausa café hasta las once y cuarto que empiezan las sesiones paralelas. Muchas gracias. Vamos a tomar un café.